Good morning. Good morning, Sergeant Major. How everybody doing? Uh -huh. Y'all ready to get some more information on insulation management? I am too. Before we get started, I'd like to recognize two honorable guests visitors, uh, we have here. The Honorable Beasley, Beasler, uh, Assistant Secretary of the United States Army Insulation and Energy. Thank you, sir, for being here with us today. General Pinar, Commanding General of the United States Army Material Command. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us for this year's ILW Commentary Military Forum, Tyler, synchronizing insulation readiness and statement for the strategy support area to the point of need. I am Command Sergeant Major Retired Thomas Capel, a, one of the AUSA ILW Senior Fellows. As your professional association, the Association of the United States Army Institution of Land Warfare is proud to provide forms like this one throughout the year that broadens the knowledge based on Army professionals and those who support our Army. This is one of the 10 AUSA ILW Professional Developments seminars conducted over the next three days. AUSA will amplify the United States Army narrative to audience inside the Army and help to further the association mission to be the voice of the Army, support for the soldiers. Of course, we cannot do this alone. AUSA relies on members to help them tell the Army's story and support our soldiers and family. A strong membership base is very important for our efforts in Congress, the Pentagon, the defense industry base, and to the public and the communities across the country through our AUSA 121 local chapters. If you are AUSA member, please stand to be recognized. Please give them a round of applause. For those of you Army professionals who are not members of your professional association, we encourage you to join by visiting AUSA membership boot, boot 307 in Exhibit Hall A, or sign up online at AUSA.org backslash membership. I say it again, AUSA.org backslash membership. Thank you for your time. And now I will turn the floor over to General Bernard and Honorable Beesner. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here and to uh, co-lead this uh, very important panel with General Perna. I want to thank the panel participants and members and the Lieutenant General David Harrison. Uh, Halverson agreed to moderate and this is where we're going to have some great discussion and I encourage the audience to effectively engage. And so, mindful of that, my remarks are going to be very brief. Um, this to me, and I am new to the Army, this is my first uh, conference here, but it strikes me that uh, the fact that we're having this topic about the role of installations in the strategic support area as part of the uh, uh, multi-domain battle, uh, uh, battle phase is extremely significant because I, th I think it shows that installations have become of age and a vital component in how we conduct our war and how we prepare for conducting the war. You look back 80 years ago and most installations were in almost total isolation and far removed from surrounding communities and far removed from any kind of threats or dangers. That obviously is no longer the case. This was exemplified in the 2018 National Defense Strategy that said the homeland is no longer a sanctuary 
and that directly uh, focuses on the installation. Not only the installation's increased role as a projection power platform, but also the fact from a threat standpoint that installations face 24-7, whether from physical, physical attack na uh, nature or, of course, cyber. So it's a brand new day, and we here have to uh, address effectively uh, this new role for the installations and how it fits in the whole battle rhythm. Um, and to highlight from quotes from the leadership that S Secretary McCarthy has directed our focus to improve strategic readiness, our ability to mobilize, deploy, and sustain the force. These functions are clearly essential to winning. And of course, as we all know, winning is the top priority, and installations are the launching point to make sure that that happens. When the Army is deployed, we go to win. It is from our installations that the Army mobilizes and deploy. Um, we, and as the Secretary also noted, we are integrating modernization efforts across doctrine, organizational designs, training models, leader development, personnel systems, facilities, and policies. And most importantly, we must do all of this while taking care of our people and all of these functions, including taking care of our people, start and in many cases or foremost at our installations. I'd like to make uh, three quick point um, to, as a takeaway so that we can further the discussion of the panel and of the audience. Number one, installations are part of the strategic readiness. It's a new lens for viewing the Army's home. Uh, as I've said, compilation of facilities and capabilities that allow it to perform critical functions in the strategic support area and um, in, uh, installations are integral and part of the MDO. Secondly, uh, Army's initial maneuver platforms, uh, launching stations literally where the rubber first meets the road as far as our war preparation and uh, projection. Third, must modernize installations. Uh, as uh, General McConville has said, we cannot have an industrial age army in the information age, and we need the army of the future or the army of tomorrow today. And that carries forth to installations as well. In order for installations to be uh, fully ready, they must be resilient to the various facts, threats that they face. And I've already mentioned the, these are primarily uh, natural, physical, and cyber. And so the resilience that we're working on for all of these factors is how best to counter such threats. And of course, one thing that I'm, my office is particularly uh, proud of is helping in that regard as far as access to power of emergency readiness exercises in the resilience area uh, to deal with the unplugging from the commercial grid. And we've done this at four different installations. We're going to do it more. The, the biggest, the most prominent was Fort Bragg, where it was uh, the, uh, the 250,000 person equivalent city of Fort Bragg was disconnected from the commercial grid for an average of 10 hours with little or advance notice. A lot of surprises came out of that as far as just exactly how resilient the fort and all of its different functions was. But we had great lessons learned, and I really encourage other installations to follow suit. Forewarn is to be effectively prepared. Um, the use of technology, 
while technology presents challenges in, in the whole cyberspace and other areas, it also presents opportunities that we need to work with the private sector and many of you and your companies and organizations that are represented here to help us get to the best technology to solve the variety of problems to make our installations uh, as resilient and as effective as possible. In my uh, office, we had a, a one small step toward that called Industry Day, where we identified 10 areas that we thought would be helpful to get uh, input from academia, private sector, on how to solve these problems. And that's going to be an ongoing conversation. So really appreciate your support, engagement, and guidance in that regard. Um, so in conclusion, please engage. This is a wonderful opportunity to do that. We need your help. And together, we can make sure that we have a strengthened army that's prepared to win and always faces unfair fight to make sure that we win. So with that, uh, it's my honor and privilege to turn it over to General Gus Perna and take it away, General. So uh, thank you all for attending today, and thanks for the audience that's uh, participating from the outer stations. I, I think today's session is going to be very worthwhile, uh, and it is about thinking of the future. Uh, first, uh, I would like to say uh, Honorable Beeler has been an incredible partner uh, as we work together from the assistant secretary level all the way down to the command level. And we are moving the ball because of that partnership. And so, sir, thank you very much. Uh, and I thought his comments were uh, right on the mark. And I'm going to highlight a couple and then get off the stage so we can let our great panel uh, uh, get going, led by General Halverson, who I still call sir because I worked for him several times. Uh, and truthfully, I'm afraid of him. Uh, so, no, PTSD. No, PTSD. We, no I, I, I say that with great admiration because of all that I learned from him. And sir, I'm so grateful that you took the time to be here today. Uh, I know introductions will be also included, but I'd be remiss if I did not recognize another mentor, uh, the Honorable Alan Estevez, who many of us know was a remarkable supporter of us while we were in Iraq and Afghanistan. And quite frankly, without his leadership and courage, we couldn't have gotten done what we did. So, sir, thank you. So, Okay, so uh, two thoughts, and then I would like to show you a quick video to kind of wrap it up, and then I'm going to pass it over to the panel. One, if, if you buy into Clausewitz, which I do, I'll self-report, uh, our responsibility is to prepare for war and execute war, and as our chief has told us, win the war, right? Uh, so prepare, execute, win. In that light, our enemies, Right, have been watching us for many years now in the fight. And they know that if they have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the greatest army the world has ever seen, with the greatest soldiers the, army know, the world knows, they are not going to win. So what will their strategy be? Their strategy potentially could be don't let the U.S. forces leave the U.S. That's why in the multi-domains operation concept, they've identified the strategic support area. And this is what we want to highlight today. We want to highlight all the things that have to go into ensuring the strategic support area is ready to execute. The Secretary and the Chief's priorities are clear. Be ready tactically, increase our readiness strategically, modernize not only our equipment, but the way we do business, the way we run our installations, and constantly reform ourselves, as Honorable Beeler said, 
the move from the industrial age into the information age. This will take leadership and effort at all levels to be successful. So if you bear with me, I'd like to wrap this up with a quick video that I am showing the workforce at Army Materiel Command to help them see themselves. So please present the video. The Army is increasing readiness for its fundamental tasks. Prepare, execute, and win our nation's wars. As we focus on near-peer competitors capable of large-scale combat operations, the Army must provide combatant commanders with trained and ready units. For the sustainment community, that means ensuring the readiness of Army units today, building capacity to surge at a moment's notice, and modernizing installations, facilities, and infrastructure to support future capabilities. To meet the increasingly lethal threat, the Army developed the multi-domain operations concept, addressing all the domains where we expect to fight. Land, sea, air, space, and cyberspace. The sustainment functions required to support multi-domain operations start and end in the strategic support area. Simply said, the strategic support area is where our nation's military might is first generated, from where it's projected, and from where it's sustained during the fight. As the Army Command responsible for the readiness of the strategic support area, Army Material Command has identified seven focus areas critical to success soldiers, civilians, and families, installations, the organic industrial base, munitions, strategic power projection, supplies and equipment, and logistics information. Soldier, civilian, and family readiness means enabling our most precious resource, our people, to meet and support our Army today and in the future. We must maximize services that soldiers and families rely on most and make our Army the employer of choice, investing in quality of life, such as safe and secure housing, available and affordable child care and youth services, increased opportunities for spouse employment, and timely, predictable PCS moves for soldiers, civilians, and families is directly tied to increased Army readiness. Installations are the Army's epicenter, not only where soldiers live, but where they train, conduct the day-to-day -day business of the Army, mobilize, and deploy from. Our installations must enable world-class training with modern capable ranges, have the right facilities to support rapid mobilization and strategic deployment operations, as well as receive our soldiers when they return home. Our vision is that every installation is our soldiers and families' number one choice to live. The Army Organic Industrial Base manufactures and resets Army equipment, supporting current unit readiness across the force and maintaining the ability to surge. With most of the 26 depots, arsenals, and ammunition plants built during World War II, the OIB must be modernized with upgraded machinery and tooling, advanced and additive manufacturing capabilities, and an artisan workforce that possesses the technical skill set to sustain the next generation of equipment. Army munitions readiness means having the right ammunition in the right place at the right time to meet today's requirements as well as future emerging capabilities. The munitions industrial base must have sufficient modernized capacity balanced with production and forward positioning to meet any contingency and any strategic surge requirement. Strategic power projection encompasses our ability to move troops and equipment and includes the ports, roads, airfields, railheads, and Army pre-positioned stocks, which enable our Army to rapidly deploy. Many of our installations are centers of power projection, supporting the total Army, Active Army, Army Reserve, and the National Guard to mobilize and generate the forces required and project those forces anywhere in the world at any time. Precision in demand analysis builds depth and breadth in the global supply chain. From consistent and timely funding, to proper technical diagnosis, to executing discipline and ordering parts, to focused installation, to timely disposition, which informs demand planning, 
Getting supply availability right requires focus at all levels throughout the process. Predictive maintenance capabilities and dynamic sustainment employment will provide the agility that allows the Army to surge when necessary. Logistics information readiness allows us to see ourselves and is critical to the move from the industrial age to the information age. Data is the highway of the future. We must streamline systems and processes and develop agile and resilient information capabilities that allow us to make predictive, real-time, and informed decisions. The Strategic Support Area is a critical enabler to Army readiness in a multi-domain operational environment. The U.S. Army Materiel Command synchronizes and integrates the seven focus areas to provide the capability our Army needs today and tomorrow through a dedicated, trained, and professional force. So, Honorable Beeler and I have asked the panel today to focus on the strategic support area to the tactical point of need, to talk through the seven focus areas, to talk to you about how they interact and how they are directly supporting the Secretary and the Chief's priorities of readiness, modernization, and reform. And as you will hear the Chief later on today, not to get in front of his headlights, but he has told us that people are our foundation. And that's what we captured in the film and our responsibility to taking care of our soldiers, our families, and our civilians, coupled with our requirements to develop the capability to project it forward and sustain it on the battlefield. So I greatly appreciate everybody's support today, being a part of this. We look forward to hearing your questions uh, so that we can be a part of helping you understand uh, and move forward. And we'll take good ideas uh, as, as you have them. So General Halverson, over to you, sir. Thanks, Gus. Well, I'll tell you, it is a great day to, to be a soldier for life, uh, and uh, it is a great day for all of you to participate in this uh, very important forum. Uh, first of all, uh, the Honorable uh, Mr. Beeler and, and, and uh, General Perner, it's great for them to kind of warm up our juices and kind of get our thoughts going and kind of give us the opening things of how do we want to uh, conduct ourselves. My name is Dave Halverson, uh, uh, retired out of the Army in 37 years, did a lot of different jobs. Uh, but my most uh, uh, jobs that you, uh, uh, you know, are, are reflect on and how you, you, how you took care of soldiers and families and how your people were. And I think that's what's really unique about this whole thing of how we're doing the domain, how the commands worked, and then how do you put this total readiness package together. And so I think we're very blessed to have great leaders and stuff working through these dynamic times to how do we have overmatch in our installations. Uh, being a, a plans person from, uh, you know, uh, being the chief of plans at CENTCOM, and understanding the interior lines, kind of what uh, Gus was saying. During the Cold War, we used to have a thing called competitive strategies. Competitive strategies are the things we kind of used to talk about warfare, like how were the Cold War? We knew the Russians uh, and the Soviet Union had huge depots underneath the ground, East Germany and everything, so we did a lot of investments on things like bunker busters, all those types of things. It's competitive strategies. They flipped the turner, uh, corner just like what uh, General Perner was saying. They know our strengths, they know our, uh, what they have and the capacities they have and then what they can do. If we never get to the ground, it's gonna be hard for us to move our interior lines. And it starts at that installational level. Because at that installational level, you have to have the time, you have to have the resources, and you have to have the training to be able to project any combat power. And that readiness, like everything, is perishable. Readiness is a perishable you know, value that we have. So we have to continue investment and continue in, uh, in all aspects of this and it's important for us to have a discussion. The best thing to have about the discussion is when you have a great panel, and I'm blessed to have a great panel of, uh, of folks that I know very well. Uh, Ed Daly is the deputy commander at the AMC. Uh, obviously, that means he does all the work that General Perna doesn't want to do, and, <laughs> and that's a lot of work uh, from the aspect that uh, he, he runs that day-to-day -day, uh, approach to how do you uh, work this enterprise you have with growing enterprises you have, and how do you get everyone on the same sheet of music empower them uh, to be a mission command uh, and understand the intent. So, Ed, it's great to have you here as the deputy commander uh, at uh, AMC. I have uh, Dwayne Gamble, the new G4 of the Army. Uh, the tough thing about uh, the, the, the Army sometimes is that you have to leave command and then you have to come to be a staff officer. But Dwayne, you've done it a few times before, 
Uh, but and it's a great uh, experience. But we're blessed to have you, uh, Dwayne, uh, and, and representing us. And congratulations on your promotion. We're also very uh, blessed to have. Uh, 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 the Honorable uh, Jordan Gillis, a good friend, the Principal Deputy Assistant to Insulation, uh, Energy, and Environment. Uh, very blessed. Uh, he was the acting for a while and now has got, gone into the, uh, the Principal uh, Deputy and is really blessed for him with the insulation side aspect of what he has to do from the policy perspective and the resource and, and the smart city per, uh, per, uh, community uh, type things. And then, like you heard from uh, General Perna, uh, the Honorable Alan Estevez. Uh, he's a logistics executive from Deloitte, but is really a, was the former principal deputy for Under Secretary of Defense and Acquisition Technology and Logistics that Gus was telling me a lot of times during the war. So, sir, uh, I'm very blessed to have this panel. There's a few things that we want to do just to kick it off, and I always say there's rules of engagement, kind of like war, right? You have to have, uh, we're going to do, uh, each panel member is going to talk about five to seven minutes on their lens and how they see they're applicable to the framework in which uh, the you know, General Perna kind of laid out. And then from there, we're gonna, I'm going to have a few questions just to get the blood going, but uh, you're going to have people walking around you. If you have questions, please send me the questions. And if you, you know, who you want to ask the question, or I'll just pick the person that I feel like it, and that's when they, they have to pay me my $5 later. But, but it really is uh, just ask some good questions, because this is supposed to be a dialogue. And, and the diversity of what we have from the people in the, uh, in the audience, the industry, uh, the leaders, they're going to really help us to make sure we're all in a clear you know, mindset or a clear focus of what we have to do. Because from here, you should take good nuggets that you're going to take back to your organizations, uh, your uh, you know, foreign countries, and all this kind of stuff. And what can we do to assist in this, in this framework? And how can we participate in the dialogue in which we think is so very, very important if we're going to fight and win? And, and, and just like uh, General Perner says, uh, that is our, our mission as an army. So without that, I'll, without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Ed Daly uh, for his first uh, comments. Ed? Great. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Yep. Hey, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it, it's an absolute honor to be part of this panel. Thanks for coming today. I know you could be on the floor doing other things. Uh, uh, your presence here is really appreciated. Uh, I want to start by thanking AUSA and ILW uh, for sponsoring uh, such a great event every year. Uh, second, I want to double back. I know General Perna thanked him, but I want to thank personally General Halverson for his three decades plus of service to our Army. And truth in lending, I'm afraid of him, too. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've worked for him, but, uh, but how about a round of applause for General no, Halverson? No, no. <laughs> uh, I, I'd also like to, to echo General Perna's comments on Honorable Estevez. Uh, sir, uh, what you've done for our Army uh, and your service uh, is unbelievable, and so we truly appreciate everything. We appreciate your partnership. How about a round of applause for Honorable Estimate? I, I also saw uh, several uh, um, partners and allies out there, uh, so how about a round of applause for them if you could raise your hand yeah. as well. Great. Um, and then also, uh, you know, General Perna talked about winning matters. The Chiefs uh, mentioned that several times. And just for the record, uh, Yankees in six against the a a Astros and, uh, and a sweep of the Nationals. So I just want to let everybody know that. That's Yankees in five, Ed. Is that your precision Yankees, forecasting? That's, my pre that's, that's uh, data analytics at its best. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, but, uh, hey, um, so I want to start by continuing to build on what Honorable Beeler and uh, General Perna uh, said in their opening comments. Uh, last year at this panel, I spoke about the following. I talked about how we're going to operationalize the sustainment warfighting function to support large-scale combat operations. I talked about how we're going to take this concept of the strategic support area and link it to operational re reach and uh, uh, freedom of maneuver uh, in support of even the most austere operations uh, in, uh, throughout the world. I also talked about the increase to tactical readiness at Echelon and discussed uh, several reforms and initiatives that we were undertaking, uh, that we couldn't settle for status quo, and that we really had to change the way we looked at the sustainment warfighting function capabilities and how we applied those capabilities to the battle space framework and geometry. So I would echo what General Perna said up front, that we're making progress. We're not in the red zone yet, to use a football uh, analogy, but we're getting first downs, we're making progress, and we continue to move the ball down the field. Uh, inst interestingly enough, I, I sat in the panel yesterday on readiness, and I, were there any, anyone else uh, in that panel on readiness? Raise your hand if you were in that panel on readiness. Uh, and so what you'll find is this is really that panel 
part two, uh, because there's an inextricable link between the strategic support area and readiness at Echelon. We'll talk a little bit about that. But I also think um, that it, it highlights the value of the uh, sustainment warfighting function and the fact that it's essential to winning uh, on the current and future battlefield. And make no mistake about it, it's a delicate balance for us logisticians. Uh, we have to be fully engaged on several ends of the spectrum. So we're focused on modernization, but yet we still have to not forget about readiness. We're focused on strategic readiness, but we can't leave tactical readiness behind. We're focused on theater requirements uh, for the Army uh, uh, Service Component Commands, but we can't forget about the whole construct of dynamic force employment. Uh, we look at Army requirements, but we can't do that divorced of joint and combined efforts. And then, obviously, we have to balance risk and investment. And so as we go through this panel today, and you think about your questions, you know, these are some things that maybe uh, you want to talk about. Uh, you know, this year, given the Chief's priority and the Secretary's priorities focused on people, readiness, modernization, reform, I want to throw, cover really three quick themes uh, in my opening points, and maybe we could talk more extensively about it. Uh, as the panel progresses. But first, I'd like to talk about the key reforms that have enabled us as an Army to get after how we're expanding and operationalizing our efforts to synchronize, integrate, and execute sustainment from the strategic support area. So obviously that's our conus based factories, our 23 organic industrial base ammunition plants, arsenals, and depots. Our, our 35 mobile mobilization force generation installations, our NFGIs and our power projection platforms, all the way to the joint security area, and then ultimately to the tactical point of need at the close and deep fight locations. And you can see that from the slide there. Secondly, I want to convey a couple of accomplishments since the last time we talked about what we were doing last year. Um, and those accomplishments focused really on not only what we're doing to support the current force, but really what we're doing in terms of supporting the MDO capable and ready forces of 2028 and beyond, essentially allowing us to win uh, in any either semi or non-permissible uh, environment. Uh, and then lastly, I want to double back uh, based on Honorable Beeler and General Perna's comments and spend just a couple seconds and go through where we're going our way ahead, and I know we'll have more discussion on that. So uh, first, um, on enabling reforms uh, that, in my mind, have really um, taken this whole concept of the strategic support area and put it to the forefront. There is no doubt um, that the strategic support area is really the center gra of gra gravity in terms of how we sustain, project, and sustain our force. You know, obviously, the first reform that's had significant impact is the the forming of Army Futures Command with the six modernization efforts, the 31 programs. But from a sustainment perspective, it starts the discussion on MDO concept and the emerging Dotlam PF requirements, life cycle sustainment plans, ensuring the right facilities, transition to sustainment, and divestiture of legacy programs. Um, again, nothing you don't know, but I just wanted to highlight that up front. Second, the reform to the planning, programming, budget, and execution system. The PEG deep dives now ensure that we can see ourselves and where we're applying our dollars, and with the, along with the change in governance to put the assistant secretaries and the ACOM commanders in charge of portfolios, I think that's very, very powerful. And this absolutely gets at appropriately resourcing our Army priorities. And so, as you know, Honorable Beeler is a co-chair in the II PEG. Dr. Jetty is a co-chair in the SS PEG, and then General Perna has co-chair responsibilities for both PEGs. And so you can see how this whole concept of the strategic support area starts to come in line. I, I will tell you that for the first time in a while, we have synchronized strategic documents. So the National Defense Strategy, the National Military Strategy, the Defense Planning Guidance, the Army Strategy, the Army Vision, the Army Campaign Plan, all ensuring one azimuth, ensuring that we're all rowing in the same direction, so to speak. And I will tell you that we're all on the same azimuth as an army. Um, and within that framework, and yesterday they mentioned it, but I think it's critical, Army Regulation 525-30 really looks at how we assess measure readiness and really looks at it through a strategic lens as opposed to just a tactical lens. 
I think that's big change in terms of what the chief talked about yesterday. And then finally, the assignment of Installation Management Command and Medical Logistics in Class 8 to AMC. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about U.S. Army Financial Command now being OPCON to AMC. Again, it gets at this whole construct of the center of gravity being the strategic support area to support in depth. Uh, number two, the accomplishments over the past year. Uh, just very, very quickly, I'm going to run through rapid fire. Uh, great progress on tactical readiness. We turn the corner on supply availability. We proactively attack the housing crisis with our RCI partners. We're continuing to set the Pacific and European theaters with logistic stocks and capabilities. We're focused and boresighted on, on log cap five. We've started the implementation of the new uh, APS, Army Preposition Stock Strategy, to better support the NDS and be more responsive to combatant commands. And with regard to strategic movements, just a quick data point for you, 83 brigade equivalents using 129 ports of embarkation and debarkation worldwide um, to support uh, our operations, both in exercise and contingency. That really shows that we're getting after this whole understanding that we've got to be able to project, project the force to be able to fight the force. Um, and then lastly, recognizing that uh, the data analytics and AI is tremendously important. We've reorganized LOGSA, the Logistics Support Agency, to now be called the Logistics Data Analytics Center, really gets after that 21st century information age approach to data analytics. And, uh, and so I'll stop there. But I did want to hit very, very quickly the way forward in terms of what we're looking at, and hopefully we'll get a chance to discuss it more. Uh, the expansion of tactical readiness to strategic readiness. And I'm going to leave it at that, but Dwayne's going to talk more extensively on that because that's a critical piece of what the Chief and the Secretary have talked about. The implementation of a comprehensive investment, facilities investment strategy designed to get our installations properly equipped and modernized um, so we can support not only soldiers and families, but the units that they operate in. Uh, to project our force, the railheads, uh, the airfields, we must have the right investments to our MFGIs and our power projection platforms. And I know Jordan Gillis is going to talk more about this installation modernization effort. We're taking a hard look at our sustainment portfolio investments for the future. Leader follower, diagnostic troubleshooting equipment like NGATS, the M8883, really our start points, but not to be confused with deeper thoughts in terms of big data analytics, predictive maintenance, synergistic ERP strategy, advanced and additive manufacturing. Those will be real combat multipliers as we move forward uh, over the next 10 years. And then making sure that we don't lose sight of that goal. These goals are really to unencumber commanders to ensure they can maneuver their force, build and sustain combat power at the tactical point of need. And that's really from the unit maintenance collection points forward. Defender 2020 objectives, one in particular that I know General Pern is focused on with regard to the strategic support area is being able to mission command all these strategic movements that are simultaneously being executed to support an op plan. Reinforcing and reinvigorating our depot um, repair cycle float program to better support the readiness models. Expand, uh, expanding and, uh, and further refining our common uh, authorized stockage list, our ASLs, at Echelon, and continuing to build strategic depth. Continuing to modernize the OIB improve how we're doing APS from a standpoint of the right location, making sure our equipment is configured for combat, and then executing that equipment so it becomes a battle drill. All those are tremendously important going, in, going towards the future. Um, and so I just want to hit those up front. And not to be forgotten, the Chief and Secretary's number one priori priority on people, improving our soldier and family programs. And you heard Honorable Beeler and, uh, and General Perna talk a little bit about that. So great opportunity ahead as an Army as we look at the sustainment warfighting function and more in particular the strate uh, strategic support area and how the strategic support area affects the tactical point of need. And so I look forward to your question. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Ed. And Dwayne? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, uh, sir, for being our panel moderator. And thanks, General Daly, for being our panel chair. I'll build on uh, General Daly's comments. Uh, with a few thoughts of my own. So I have one slide up there. Uh, I'm not so, so sure I got it right. I unveiled this yesterday to the former Army G4s, and I got 
you know, a lot of criticism. So they said, one, one gentleman said, uh, hey, Dwayne, I want to let this, you know, out in public because somebody might, you know, misread it. Uh, so anyway, so not sticking with my normal mode of operation, I bypass good advice, and there it is. So uh, anyway, it's probably sage advice too, but anyway, uh, this will, if you give you something to look at while I'm babbling. So a couple things. One, I'm on, uh, this is second day of week four is the Army G4. So as General Halpins has had a move from command to staff, which really means you move from execution to resourcing. Uh, and so my comments are really through that lens, but you know, I, I'm also cognizant that I'm, had, I'm a little, uh, uh, defi I have a deficit on experience in this role. Um, but if we think to the theme of this, this conference, ready today, investing for tomorrow, and then, you know, just pull the thread on that. I really do think, and General Daly uh, really hit it on it, we have, the Army, the collective Army has moved the ball uh, this last couple of years when it comes to readiness. And, and that readiness uh, is from strategic to tactical. Really, the ball has moved really, really far. But we have miles to go in terms of positioning and posturing our Army, uh, in terms of both strategic readiness and tactical readiness. Um, and we must remain vigilant, and we must continue, as the Secretary said yesterday, to ruthlessly prioritize uh, our available resources. And so here's my premise to you, kind of my thesis, um, is that while we've moved the ball, I think we are, we are literally, you know, every day one step away from possibly uh, slaughtering strategic readiness and sacrificing it at the altar of tactical readiness, right? We can, we can chase tactical readiness and we could bleed ourselves dry when it comes to resources uh, and, and be negligent, if you will, in terms of building strategic readiness for our Army and the Joint Forces. The Army uh, is the foundation for that Joint Force. And so uh, how do we prevent that from happening, right? I'll offer you just two simple things. First, we're, we have to be excellent at echelon when it comes to sustainment and logistics. Excellent at echelon. It means everybody's got to do their job. Everybody has to have con reflexive competency in their job. Uh, and they have to do their job with the resources they have. And the second piece is uh, we must ma establish and maintain both strategic readiness and tactical readiness, uh, and neither at the expense of each other, right? And I think our, our kind of where everybody was a great company commander, and great first sergeant, uh, and that's really about a tactical environment. And so I think our nature is to focus on tactical readiness, and sometimes at the expense of strategic readiness. Um, so the, the priorities are clear, right? Readiness, modernization, reform, and we can do both. We can balance both, uh, but primarily it's through reform, uh, because re readiness and modernization are two dials that turn and they compete with each other when it comes to limited resourcing and so the only thing left is really reforming our way out of the hole and that takes ruthless prioritization I think our secretary uh, said it very very clearly yesterday I believe it takes moral courage I got been a supporter my whole life you know, one time General Dahl when he was the MCOM commander was talking to General Daly and I about um, General Daly me about uh, you know, supporting other people and how he was a fire supporter. And we're, look, no supporter likes to say no to somebody, but I found myself in, in, in ASC saying no to a bunch of people that I re respected and that I wanted to support. But, but I believed at the time uh, that, we need, that we needed to prioritize and, and focus the resources on the intended purpose. In, in many cases, it was installation. In fact, in every case, we said no to somebody. It was to free up resources for installation logistics focused on power projection, which by, on my chart that I was told not to show anybody, it, you know, that, that falls under strategic readiness, our ability to project our force uh, from, as General Daly said, our center of gravity, our Army installations. And so you can see on the chart there, I probably got it totally wrong. Also, I was coached yesterday that it needs to say industrial base and not organic industrial base. And then my confidence was buoyed a little bit because General Pernas' film said organic industrial base. So anyway, you can see how I've defined strategic readiness and, and tactical readiness there on the chart. And I won't bore you with that. Uh, but here, I'll leave you with this, and then you can push back on me. Uh, ruthless prioritization is still required, right, to, to get this right for our Army, get this right for the Joint Force. 
Uh, and it's not a it, it's not a mutually exclusive, right? I'm, it's oversimplified on the chart. It's not mutually exclusive. You don't have to choose one or the other, but we do have to do both. We have to do both with excellence, with a hallmark of our army, uh, and we must do it persistently over time, and and have very consistent funding uh, by our Congress and our nation, but also in ourselves, within our army. We have to be very persistent and consistent in the way we make these investments. So I look forward to your questions. I look forward to your ideas, more important than your questions. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Gillis. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dwayne. Uh, Honorable uh, Jordan Gillis. Sir? So I, uh, that's funny how you can see the slide build backwards, because uh, I guess we got out of order. So well, first, you know, good morning. Thank you for having me. Thanks to AUSA for, for putting this panel together. This is a great one, and it's unusual because usually when I'm on a panel, it takes about six or seven nominations to get the people to fill the other slots who are willing to be on stage with me. But in this case, we somehow got the first string. So I'm, uh, yeah. I'm very honored and, and grateful to be sharing the stage with these folks. So to help triangulate you on to my position, if you look back or remember back to the sustainment model that General Perna showed, that General Daly showed, one of the seven focus areas is installation readiness. And so that's where I am and, and that's where I'm coming from. And I've got some really great prepared remarks that I'll try to refer to, but um, I can't see them in this light and I don't want to look like <laughs> my dad trying to read a menu in a restaurant with a flashlight on his phone. Um, so, so stick with me uh, while, I, while I work through my vanity. And uh, so I'll, spoiler alert, I think that an installation needs to be four things, um, resilient, efficient, effective and affordable. And so I was going to build the slide so that you can see each one of those four things as I as I talked about them, but here they are up front so we can go ahead and, and build that. All right, see the resilient and the illustrations that go with resiliency. And then the next one, efficient. All right, and here we go. One more. Effective and then finally affordable. All right, so as you know, we say it all the time that we, we take risk in installations. And, uh, and that terminology is kind of a pet peeve of mine. That, that really means that we underfund them and we hope that nothing <laughs> bad happens. So we've been doing that and um, you know, so far nothing terrible has happened. But now with multi-domain operations, we finally get some recognition that installations are squarely in the strategic support area. They are part of the battle space. And so there is, uh, there is a lot less desire to underfund or take risk with respect to installations. So I think that's part of the goodness that comes with multi-domain operations. Um, but we'll start from the beginning. So installations must be resilient. I'll talk about what that means to me in a nutshell. It's that installations are not totally reliant on off-site energy or off-site water. It means in the event of a grid outage or a water disruption, that an installation can still carry out its critical missions. Maybe not every mission, and maybe not do everything that they do on a normal day, but at least carry out those critical missions. So to get after that, we're, we're identifying gaps with respect to that. Mr. Beeler this morning talked about the energy resilience readiness exercises that we've conducted at uh, Fort Knox, Fort Greeley, Fort Stewart, and uh, Fort Bragg. And those are great, very valuable when you disconnect power from the grid you find uh, a lot of things that you can't find through a tabletop exercise or through looking at a uh, wiring diagram. You know, some of the things like systems that we thought had secondary power don't. Uh, things that we thought were powered by emergency power were not. Uh, the maintenance approach that we believed was sufficient for a generator or for refueling uh, was not sufficient. And so those are, those are good. And we can bring those things to light and then we can make projects or put forward projects that will address those things and uh, include the, the gaps and the ways to close the gap in installation uh, master plans and installation energy and water plans. So in addition to those kind of things, installations need to be resilient to threats. And Mr. Beal talked about those too. He talked about physical threats, natural th uh, threats, um, cyber threats. And those are all things that, uh, you know, I don't want to enumerate all of the threats to installations or, or what we're doing to address them. But, you know, we bring red teaming and, and we test our vulnerabilities in a lot of different ways and through a lot of regular exercises like uh, force comps mobilization exercises 
and other things that we do routinely to be sure that we're ready. And so then the last thing on resilience, I'll quote uh, Tradox Pam on, on MDO, which is where I learned everything I know about MDO. I encourage you to get a copy. The uh, support areas, so in our case, we're talking about the strategic support areas, represent that space in which the joint force seeks to retain maximum freedom of action, speed, and agility to counter the enemy's multi-domain effort to attack friendly forces, infrastructure, and populations. So to gain and maintain that freedom of action, speed, and agility requires resilient installations, and so that's, so that's our goal. Uh, efficiency, installations must be efficient. So I envision future platforms where uh, we're going to need more energy, not less. And so that means we have to keep a close eye on how we use it on installations and uh, how we supply it and how we, uh, how we provision for backup. The other key to efficiency is being able to use data as we create our future vision. That includes automated sensors, um, ways to capture the data, data lakes, big data, and then, of course, the analytics on top of it that will allow us to make smart decisions when it comes to uh, power savings, traffic flows, training schedules, child care requirements, peak hours at the gate, and all the other functions you can think of that support soldiers, units, and families. Um, you know, we've got systems on installations where all this data lives, and as we're trying to work through that transition between the industrial age to the information age, installations are really the perfect test bed to see if we've got that right. Uh, 5G, AI, big data, installation and garrison leaders can really be on the forefront of uh, pilots to make sure that we are using and managing that data as best we can. And so as the Army modernizes, uh, so must installations. And you can see our approach to evaluating that, .milpf, uh, really shows that we are considering installations and facilities and infrastructure as we modernize. And then so installations must be effective. So first and foremost, an effective installation uh, meets the needs of, of senior commanders and tenants without friction. So you can probably think of a time in your office or uh, dealing with a service provider, you know, I don't know, credit card company, an online vendor, where you know, the experience for you, it's been like a well-oiled machine and you kind of take for granted all the things that go on behind that process. And that's really what you know, we would strive to do with installations as well. And, um, you know, not just for power projection or uh, mobilization force generation things, but imagine a soldier who PCSs, arrives at their new installation, signs their CAT card, and automatically it spits out all of their in-processing uh, in paperwork gets pre-populated with all the, you know, I'd say it spits it out, so it's paperless, right? This is enabled by big data. So maybe it appears on their smart pad, and it's got everywhere that they need to go or everything that they need to do to in-process, including uh, having the kids enrolled in school, identifying the sports that the kids are going to participate in, uh, everything that the spouse needs to, needs to do, their housing information, it's all pre-populated, and it's enabled by technology. It's really a great way to, to show a soldier and their family that, uh, that we care about them. You know, imagine going on to post during peak times and you, you experience frictionless entry where um, facial recognition and license plate scanners will speed the process of people getting through the gate. I think anybody that's tried to get on or off post during PT hours or during lunch uh, can see the benefit there. So that's just a few things, but really, you know, that, that leads you to installations need to be affordable. So all that stuff that I mentioned, all of the vision that we have for uh, installation of the future, uh, doesn't come free. And we also don't want to sign up for something that will then have a sustainment tail uh, that, will, that will take more and more dollars than the initial cash outlay. So, you know, the future's not inconceivable. And it's really here, and a lot of cities are taking advantage of smart city technology that we could uh, use on installations. And you know, where we are, though, with the challenges posed by aging infrastructure, which extends beyond housing, it extends underground where you can't see storm water, wastewater, uh, electric infrastructure, natural gas. You know, we're at the point where all that needs needs modernizing just to get to today's standards. Never mind getting to the installation of the future. Um, 
so like General Gamble said, it's really relentless prioritization and, uh, and ruthless prioritization that enables us to then spend on modernization to get installations up to par so that they can support the force in a way it needs to be supported. But to get us the rest of the way, you know, prioritization won't do it. Um, we really need the best ideas. We need everyone involved. We need the best collaboration, whether that's uh, private sector industry, whether it's the communities adjacent to the installations, um, any soldiers for life who have transitioned from being garrison commanders to city managers. Those, uh, those are the folks whose ideas we need to bring to the forefront. So I think uh, you know, our first task with respect really to modernization is getting the data right. And so once we get the data right and we know how to see ourselves, we'll be able to, to move out and prioritize in ways that we get the best bang for our buck. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. But together, you know, we need your help. We need everyone engaged uh, to build those installations of the future and to be sure that installations are right there neck and neck with, uh, with the rest of the Army as it modernizes. Thanks, sir. Uh, Mr. Estevez? Great. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dave, and thank you, Dave and Ed, for putting together this great panel. Excuse the voice. Uh, I also want to thank AUSA for allowing us up here. I think this is a, an excellent opportunity. <clears throat> Lastly, I want to uh, recognize my friend, former colleague, Honorable John Conger, sitting down in the front row, former Deputy Comptroller of the Department of Defense and former Assistant Secretary for Energy Installations and Environment, who taught me everything I know about installations. Show me the money. <laughs> We're getting to that. So I'm batting cleanup. That means essentially my job is to recap what's been going on here, and you're going to hear that. Um, but I intend to clean the bases while I'm doing that. I also want to point out, General Daly, that I meant what I said, 4 o'clock, you and I, out of here. Go watch the game. I'm there, sir. Great. Um, so you know, we've had this whole discussion here about strategic to tactical, and when you think about warfighting capability and our ability to defer, to deter and defeat our enemies, you have to think about it across that full spectrum from strategic to tactical. If you ignore any part of that spectrum, and each of you have said that in some, some regard, uh, you're going to lead a bad outcome at that tactical edge where we have to win. So you have to play the home game as well as the away game in order to, to defeat uh, our enemies. And if you don't, again, bad outcome. So that means you can't ignore, and I have to mention this even though we're talking installations, you can, cannot ignore our logistics capability. I'm sitting here in a room with some of the best logisticians I know, which happens to mean that's some of the best logisticians this nation has to offer. If you ignore our logistics capability, which is an enabling combat power of this nation, it is not a back office function, it is a frontline capability, bad outcome. You cannot play that away game without the great logistics capability that we have. If you ignore the industrial base, and I'm in a room full of people who are part of that industrial base, again, you cannot sustain that war fight. You have to care and feed for the industrial base, and you have to understand your industrial base in order to win. And finally, you have to pay attention to the installation base. The installations where we train, the installations where we project combat power, the installations where we test our capabilities, and oh, by the way, the installations where our people live, where our families live, where you all live that are in uniform. If you ignore that, you're going to impact soldier, you're going to impact the family, you're going to impact retention, you're going to impact end game readiness. And those things cannot be ignored, again, if you expect to win. So. What do, we, what do we have to do to think about that? One, we have to ensure that our installations are adequately funded, and I'll talk about that in a little while. I spent six years programming for the Department of Defense. When John and I were in there, installations were not adequately funded. We managed to get them just funded at the baseline. We were living in a different era than my colleague to, to my right here is living in today. But that era is not far from coming back, and, and if you look at the the budget line and you look at the deficit where it is. Two, installations have to be adequately managed. And Jordan just went through a whole bunch of things about how to adequately manage an installation. And again, I'm going to kind of recap some of those things. So what do, you, what do I mean by that? And let me cover the management piece first. 
got to look at management through the lens of resiliency and through the lens of capability. So, you know, we take a armored battalion commander. He goes up and he be as the division or the core S3. And then we say, your next job is the mayor of Fort Hood. Training to be the mayor of Fort Hood. And really, the mayor of Fort Hood means he has to manage a whole bunch of contracts and understand contracts and understand the capability around those contracts. We have to do better at putting those leaders in the position so that they can actually do the job that we're giving them to do. And that, again, that's not just in the Army, that's across the services, quite frankly. Then we have to look out and have the ability to say, what are the best practices in managing an installation? What's going on at Fort Bliss that I should be doing at Fort Drum? And that is not without with doing it through a cookie cutter approach. And General Gamble and I had a discussion about this. Just because I do it, at, you know, Fort Bliss and Fort Drum are two different environments, right? So just because I'm doing it here doesn't mean it's applicable at the other place, but it might be. What are the best practices? How do I do those contracts? You know, I managed service contracting for the Department of Defense in my, my previous life. That's about 100 in my day, $155 billion worth of spend. It's probably up about 175 to 180 right now. Installations were about $25 billion in that, that realm. What are we doing with that $25 billion? And how are we managing it? And what's the best practices that we should be applying? So we need to do better there, again, so that I can get both better effectiveness and better efficiency out of the installations. And you can do both. We can chew gum and walk. You have to look at you know, what's, what shared services should we be uh, doing with the communities around our installations? When is that applicable? When is it not applicable? When do I rely on outside power? And when do I need my own internal power? And certainly for a power projection platform, you're going to need that. What's the best practices on cyber protection? Who's doing what and how do you do that? You know, I had the opportunity, uh, some of you have heard this story, uh, to go to a, a Yankee game last year with General Dahl right before he retired. And there was a rain delay in the game, so KD and I got to spend about 12 hours together between watching baseball, drinking a few beers, and talking about installation management, amongst other things. And I asked KD, you know, what, what, what's on your mind? And he said, cyber, cyber, cyber. And he said, you know, my view, I tell people who have railheads on their installations, and most of our power projection platforms do, it's go find the old crank that was used when that was a manual rail switch back in 1940 when the railhead was put on that installation. Go find a giant can of WD-40 and start figuring out how to make that crank work because when the cyber strike comes, we still need to deploy the force. So we need to think about those things. And again, I, I commend you, Jordan, for, for the comments you made around that. Modernization, to your point. You know, we have some antiquated infrastructure out there. You know, we're not quite living in those World War II barracks that was the old days, but, you know, they're now 1970s barracks. So <laughs> there, there's some work to be done in modernizing. When we modernize, when we have to make those investments, what are the capabilities that we need to be putting in place? So, you know, you mentioned smart cities. What are those smart capabilities? What are those sensor suites that are actually increase security at a more effective method that we need to be putting in at, around our installations? What kind of autonomy and autonomous vehicles can be used on installations? You know, that bus route may not need a driver in the future as it goes from point to point, but you have to put in the infrastructure in order for that to work. Uh, you know, New buildings all have to be metered so that we can manage what's going on and we can start regulating our energy use. Again, for the effectiveness point. Predictive maintenance, you know, there's predictive maintenance capability out in the commercial sector that looks and says, you know, if you have a carrier, blah, 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 number HVAC in a four-story building in Chicago, here's how often you should be uh, updating that, you know, doing maintenance on that uh, HVAC system. If you have that same HVAC system in Killeen, Texas, you might need to do it a little more often because it's working harder in the <laughs> summer. Now, those exactly. are the type of things that we need to be thinking about and putting in place. 
We need to think about lifestyle choices on installations. You know, we start looking at what the force of the future looks like, and I know I'm using last administration's term for that. But if I look at that, and I look at the millennial soldier of the future, and I look at the millennial spouse of the future, what amenities do we need to give them? Do I need to have we work type spaces for spouses to work in so that they can go to a place and do their business without going off post and giving them those opportunities. So those are things we need to start thinking about. And then I, I come back to contracting. I'm gonna quote Dave Petraeus here, who, who talked about it from the contingency perspective, but contracting is commander's business. So I go back to that training element. What's the best way to do a contract? Should I be doing it centrally? Should I be doing it across the, the installation base? Or does it have to be done at that installation? What do I need? And contract cannot be done written on a scrap of paper and then hand it to the contracting officer and expect the contracting officer to go make that work for you. One. Two, no contract. No contract. No contract is a fire and forget contract. Whether that's a public-private partnership contract or a regular old far base contract. And I think uh, in our little housing debacle, we learned that if you go fire and forget, you forgot. And that's not a good outcome there. So you have to manage contracts regardless of how they're led. And then the final thing I need to talk about is, uh, is funding. And again, you know, we're in a period right now where I think installations, you know, I heard General, uh, Secretary McCarthy talk about it yesterday, which is incredible, uh, talking about the importance of installations. We have a whole panel up here talking about the importance of installations in order to get those things that I was just talking about, you do have to adequately fund installations. Okay, right now, so in about four years, three, four years, when the Army Big Six looks like it's going to be, I'm gonna make some choices, some ruthless choices, maybe Big Four, maybe Big Three, is it gonna be, I can do Big Three plus fund installations, or I do Big Four, those are choices that we're going to have to make, and again, I go back to the start of my remarks. If you break that chain in the continuum, you lead to a bad outcome. So we have to think about that ruthlessly. And with that, I look forward to the questions. All right, good. Well, obviously, you can say from the panel, we we, we threw out their ideas, kind of what and what they're looking at, what they're focused on, and a lot of different things. I'll tell you personally, uh, when, uh, the four stars when they retire, the the thing they miss most is their G5. I'm just talking, they have, because they, they, they have to go to the airports. I'm just, <laughs> the biggest thing I learned is when I retired and stuff is being a homeowner is, wow, it's expensive, right? <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing. So this resourcing thing, I think, Alan, like you were talking about, and choices like prioritization and stuff, uh, Dwayne, like you talked about, and, and then uh, with uh, Jordan talked about the, uh, the, the priorities and how do you sit there and move and partnerships that you may have to explore and do so you can create win-wins and then how does it fa you know fix uh, fix you know fix you know into what you're talking about Ed of everything from the strategic into the tactical to maintain you have this especially with the scope and everything you have at AMC now this is real world and the good thing is like we said we have to be able to solve it so we have a few questions. But what I really want you to do is, you know, bring the questions and, and write down your questions. Hopefully, they'll collect them so we can uh, 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 move uh, move forward. Um, one of the things, uh, Jordan, uh, we kind of talked about that. Uh, are you concerned about the state of the electrical grid, and what's the extent that the UMI, uh, Army can sustain power across its home base? I mean, are, are, you know, what, I mean, obviously that's a, you know, a, a threat. We talked about the cyber thing. We talked about a lot of things, but. Where are we in the electrical grid and your partnerships, and how, did, how, how comfortable are, uh, do you feel? So, uh, you know, our grid nationwide, it's vulnerable. I mean, we've seen blackouts due to uh, human error in the, uh, in the grid operators. We've seen physical attacks on the grid. Somebody tried to snipe at a, uh, at a substation in California. Uh, and, and I think we're all pretty sure that they're bad actors who've accessed the cyber systems that control it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm worried about the grid, and that was really one of the things that prompted the Army to issue a policy that requires installations to try to achieve 14 days of assured power for critical missions. 
And that was, uh, I guess, in 2017. Since then, we have we have sought to revise, and I, I think it's in, is anybody here from uh, Office of General Counsel or Office of Judge Advocate General. All right, so there we've got this thing in staffing, and we're waiting for them to sign off on it. That'll uh, that'll then give installation commanders, senior commanders, a little more leeway than the 14 days that we mandated. So 14 days was a great start, but that might not be right for every mission, for every installation. So if your mission is to push out a brigade combat team in 96 hours, then maybe you need 96 hours. If, if your job is to uh, keep under refrigeration some uh, nasty bio agents in your lab, then maybe you need to never lose power. Um, and, and, I, and I would support that. Um, so, so we're trying to modify the 14-day requirement, but at least that's the baseline to address uh, any worries that we've got related to the commercial power grid. Good. Thanks, sir. Hey, hey Dave, could yeah. I just jump in on that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, a couple things to build on that. First, I think we need to think about, you know, in some installations we have uh, commercial power on the installation that's selling power to the grid, but also has the ability to sell power at the installation. Where that makes sense, we need to keep doing those things. Obviously, you know, there's alternative power sources, generators and the like. Uh, battery power is uh, changing. Uh, if you go down to some of the booths down on the floor here, there's some folks there, and we need to think about how we can put that in there as backup power. We also need to think about that power issue related to cyber threat, not just for what we think about as installations, uh, you know, the, our big power projection platforms or our training installations, but I think we need to think about it for places like Sunny Point and Concord where we have to deploy uh, ammunition out. And frankly, we probably need units that can open up other ports with uh, power, you know, mobile power that we should deploy with. Uh, and I know some of that's a, a job for Steve Lyons to be thinking about. Nonetheless, it's our Army that's going to go through those ports. Well, uh, thanks, sir. I appreciate those. Uh, uh, Ed, um, how can the military and industry work together to transform the Army supply availability and the equipment readiness that's uh, ready to support them in the MDO environment? Uh, what are you doing, or how, how, how is that going? Yeah, so I think, I think there's a couple of, you know, you can, you can look at this in almost phases. Um, the, the first is um, really how do we get after our requirements in the competition phase? Um, because they're a lot less, um, but they set the conditions for what we need in terms of being in the conflict phase. And so I think when you look at um, the organic industrial base, first, uh, and, and Honorable Estevez has talked a little bit about it, is that we need to make sure that the organic industrial base can surge to meet our requirements. Um, I think that's the first thing. And not just surge from a standpoint of um, uh, reset and rebuild of major platforms, but also from a standpoint of depot level repairables, uh, as an example. You know, when you look at it, uh, we've continued to increase and spike. In, in 2015, we were doing probably about 150,000 uh, DLRs each year. Now we're up to almost 300,000. Well, that's a prime, that, that primes the pump for uh, supply availability. But the organic industrial base is key to that. Um, and having the organic industrial base be able to steady state and surge to meet those requirements is absolutely key. I think the second thing is, um, you know, uh, as Duane mentioned, that delicate balance, and I hit it on just a little bit, that delicate balance between tactical uh, uh, readiness and strategic readiness, you know, we have been focused on fixing supply availability at the tactical level, getting our BCTs ready. You heard the Secretary talk yesterday about our readiness status of our BCTs. And I'll just tell you, across the whole Army, 90% of our Army is at the <coughs> highest equipment readiness levels. And when you look at every unit, not just BCTs, which is very, very good. The next step we got to get to is increasing the strategic depth so that we can be postured better to support future requirements. And then the positioning of those stocks accordingly, because distribution <coughs> is key. And as Honorable Estevez mentioned, you know, when you have a, a, a present and clear cyber threat uh, and an enemy that is not going to attack our strengths but our vulnerabilities, we need to make sure that positioning is key and our distribution system remains intact to be able to support down to the tactical level. So all those things, for all those reasons, I think, um, you know, supply availability, organic industrial base really, really is key 
to be able to support an MDO environment. Mm -hmm. Hey, Dwayne, uh, you, you uh, talked about that balance, and now as a G4 and stuff, you have to really play in that as you work it, but that, that strategic readiness, I've heard the chief talk about it. I mean, he understands the tactical readiness and its empowerment of how you're doing that, but strategic readiness, is the dialogue and then how you apply in that, because uh, I know within the Army, we do provide a lot of capabilities that either in the all domain, that's a requirement for us to help the other services and stuff. How are they and are we getting any burden sharing from the other services to provide, you know, or assistance in us to, in that strategic readiness portion? Yeah, so, <coughs> um, the, so from the strategic readiness piece, there's a couple different, yeah. you know, Army support to other services. Much of that is operational tactical, of course, right? The, you know, each Army service component command, commander sets a theater, and the primary you know, tool he has are formations, right? right? American soldier and formations to do that. At the strategic level, um, I, I don't, I'm really unaware of any burden sharing for, uh, for th between the other services, but, but I'll just throw one out there, right, that yeah. is, that's tangentially related. You know, the, the Army pays the lion's share of uh, both working capital funds, strategic working capital funds that support us, the Transportation Capital Working Fund and the Defense Working Capital Fund. So all the other services pay their fair share of that right. too in terms of supply availability and, and strategic transportation. Uh, but because the Army is the biggest consumer, we're paying, uh, we're, we pay, we bear the lion's share of those two funds. And then something a little bit more uh, maybe more tangentially related is we have an archaic, you know, statute or regulation that says the Army pays all the second destination transportation for AFES, although it's AAFES, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, right, nobody else pays that, right? right. So, that, but so that competes for the money for our nickels and dimes, our resources, you know, as we pay AFES for second destination transportation, uh, you know, we don't. If that money doesn't go to something else. Now you can argue, and people do argue, uh, that well, we want to get that money appropriated, right? It's appropriated for a specific purpose, and then yeah. we pass it through to AFES. Uh, but I refuse to let the the idea go that the Army, you know, has a legacy responsibility uh, to bear the cost for second destination for Army and Air Force exchange uh, system or services. So uh, I can't think of any other. You know, cost sharing though, besides ones I've highlighted. Yeah, okay, thanks. It, it always depends, is there always an argument there? Because we do get a lot of tasks, as you know, just uh, and right. how, does, how does that all work? Hey, I, uh, I think, you yeah. know, uh, so uh, one, one more, and Dwayne, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think, um, and, and it's, and it's uh, quite frankly, maybe we expanded a little bit, but it, it's the DLA concept of, of recapitalization of fuel facilities in CONUS. Um, you could almost consider that cost sharing, but I think more so, you know, that's an opportunity to look at where else can we do that? Like you said, I mean, although it's not happening, there may be opportunities that we can get after in the future. Um, just to tag on to what you said. Uh, you know, so. hey, uh, Alan, uh, I got on the reference to the industrial base and, 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 and exciting the industrial base and the partnerships. That, you know, how do you transform and how do you modernize the industrial base and what ways can we? Uh, you know, focus the industrial aid so it, so it can support the you know, in, in strategic yeah. support area in the MDO. I mean, uh, can you have a few ideas that can help us think that through that? I do. Yeah. So a couple of things. First of all, Dwayne, I liked your slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking out in the audience to I see. I modified it based on the wisdom of the uh, previous G4s. We modified it last night, so I took out the controversial stuff. But, yeah. but I would also note that it should say, commercial and organic industrial base, because yeah, yeah. you need both. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, frankly, uh, building on your comments, uh, that's true uh, and to your remarks, too. I need to be able to push stuff through depot, but I also need the industrial base to be able to search, which gets at the heart of Dave's question. So first, we need to understand what our industrial base is. Who's out there that can do the things that we need to do? Who's out there that's not doing them for us today that but could do them? Who's out there that's at risk that I need to watch, and at risk either financially or because they're doing business with people that may be malign? Sometimes they don't even know that. So we need to have an understanding of what our industrial base is. One, 
Two, and I, and I commend the Army, you know, for stepping out on this. You know, the Army just put out a, uh, a new instruction on advanced manufacturing, and it talks about not just advanced manufacturing in the depot, and that's not additive. That's, you know, advanced manufacturing is a broader term, you know, which includes digital, digital digitalization of the industrial floor, uh, digital twins and the like. You know, uh, and, and Dr. Ross and I had a conversation, Alexis Ross and I had a conversation about this. How do you build that into the contracts that we build for buying weapon systems so that we encourage the industrial base to make those kind of investments that actually increase their capacity and their ability to th throughput material? Because, you know, let's get, let's face it, it's not Freedom of Forge time again. We're not going to convert River Rouge to start cranking out joint strike fighters. Weapons are too sophisticated today to do that. So we need to start nurturing where we can go to do those kind of capabilities and doing things like I just talked yeah. about, and yeah. encouraging that investment by the industrial base itself yeah. for themselves, but also for the military is a way to get around about that. Yeah, great. Hey, yeah. hey, sir, so, so you brought up a great point in terms of um, Freedom's Forge. And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if you, if you haven't read Freedom's Forge, I would read the book. Um, it's a great book that really juxtaposes World War I and World War II, the preparations yeah. for World War I with what we did uh, before World War II and how we got it much more right in World War II than we did in World War I. But there's a lot of pa uh, uh, parallels, quite frankly, that should start getting us, uh, for those of you who are sustainers in the audience, to start thinking about how do we posture for the next conflict? And how do we leverage not just the organic industrial base, but the industrial base writ large that Honorable Estevez is talking about? I mean, I think that's tremendously powerful, powerful you know. Um, and as the saying goes, you know, it, those who, who don't read history, are, uh, you know, doomed to repeat it. Um, and, and I would just tell you that's a great book if, if you haven't read it. Yeah. That, that's that's a great point because there there is we're at a very fragile spot right like how many how much real metal bending are they're doing right now in our country that build combat systems I mean build build these things you can you, there's some that were old Cold War stuff like you're saying uh, uh, that we have in Lima and stuff like that but the actual building of new bending and, and, and standard there's only about one or two that actually do that stuff yeah so very interesting. Um, one of the things, uh, you know, uh, if uh, you know, uh, Mr. Gillis, uh, regarding insulation resilience, protection, and modernization, like you talked to ensure that force projection is available, and what are real critical and, and, and essential in your viewpoint uh, from that perspective? Are there any non-negotiables or what you're really trying to focus in, as you look at your policies? Uh, yeah, there, there are probably, probably three things. Um, I guess the first non-negotiable would be protection of soldiers, families, civilians, units, equipment, and the network. So kind of the security of the installation and the mission. Uh, the other non-negotiable, which we're negotiating over, is uh, quality infrastructure. So clearly it's, it's required, and I'm talking about barracks, uh, you know, maintenance, um, all the facilities on an installation. And then, and then finally, the third thing to strive for our soldier and family services that are uh, commensurate with civilian expectations. So, and I don't necessarily mean delivered by the Army, but that, um, like Mr. Estevez said, that the millennials who are the soldiers of the future uh, can live on an installation and receive the kind of services they expect, whether that's as simple as Amazon package delivery or being able to pick a pick up an Uber, um, we need to be in line with civilian expectations, reasonable expectations for, for services. Yeah, good. Hey, hey sir, yeah. I, I would also say, uh, Jordan, and you and I have talked about this, is that I think with regard to in, uh, installations, it's just slightly different than we talk about uh, some of the other operational requirements mm -hmm. that, you know, obviously in the battle space. Um, I, I think when you, you talk about installations, you have to do it and, and the future of installations, we have to look at it through an entrepreneurial lens. And, and what I mean by that is there are opportunities right now that we probably don't take the best advantage of in terms of enhanced use lease programs, et cetera, where the local community, one, it's a partnership effort, but 
where we can draw funds then that can be diverted now and used to support soldier and family programs and, and bolster that requirement so you're really taking care of people. Um, we do that well in some areas, but not uniformly across the board. And I know, Jordan, you and I have had that conversation, but I think that'll be powerful going, going towards the future, looking at it through that lens. And Ken Talkie, you used to be a, a garrison commander at Rock Island, and so you know, you know you've talked about it with Dwayne Gamble, and um, you're doing some innovative things, or we're doing some innovative things up at Rock Island. Uh, there are some other pockets of excellence where we have to use those best practices going forward. If we really want to get at moderniza modernization of installations, because as you all know, it's no secret that you're not going to get all the resources you need to be able to modernize installations. Um, you'll be able to do certain things at certain locations, but in order to increase your buying power and flexibility, you really have to look at it through an entrepreneurial lens. Well, Ed, like, so, like, how is AMC, you know, how are you going to prioritize in your viewpoints, you know, from sustainment and installation pegs? You said you got two of them sure. that you're, you know, General Perner, uh, as he co chairs those things. What process have you put in place to kind of prioritize that and then try to? to set some things and build a, you know, a coalition that fully understands because there's second, third order effects as you have senior mission commanders and all the installations to facilitate that and empower them to make good decisions. Yeah, uh, so, so I would tell you, you know, so Dwayne and, and Jordan can jump in here, but I, I would just tell you that the way we work the PEG governance processes leading up yeah. to uh, Palm Lock um, and the way we go back and back brief the, the senior leaders based on um, their priorities, um, there's a lockstep process where you go through the reviews at the lowest level, the MDEP levels, up through uh, quarterbacks and champions so they get to the co-chairs. Um, and we make sure that we're following the money, every single dollar, and that it's appropriately apl apl applied. The other key thing I think that's powerful and it gets back to the strategic support area is that when you have um, between Honorable Beeler, Dr. Jetty, and General Perna who, who really own uh, responsibility and accountability for two pegs, the SS and II peg, and it just so happens when we talk about the SS peg in those seven areas, most of the resourcing for those seven areas comes from those two pegs. Yeah. So you're able to juxtapose the two and figure out where you need to, to migrate money back and forth to be able to get at the priorities. Um, but the other thing too is, I, I think when you talk about soldier and family programs on installations, you can't um, had the conversation with talking about non-appropriated funds, which is separate of that. Mm -hmm. um, the non-appropriated fund piece, quite frankly, um, and I'll just self-report, I think we have uh, a strategy, but, it, but it's got to be a relook strategy. Because if we do it right, we can really, really maximize, get at this entrepreneurial approach, so to speak, um, to really get at the chief's priority of, of people. That makes sense. So, yeah. so, so Ed, let me just jump in there, and I, and I love that comment about an entrepreneurial approach to this. You know, and I, I made the comment of identifying best practices. I think with income going to AMC, first it gives you a, a them another platform, right, a higher level platform to adjust that, and to look out and see what those best practices are, sure. so that you can be the entrepreneurial engine for those, you know, local decisions that then can be brought up to a higher level and trans transmitted across. I'd also make the point, you know, having spent most of my life in the joint world, the other services have the same issue. So you guys need to be talking, I'm sure you are, Jordan, I'm sure you are, Ed, but to, to your counterparts and the other services to see where their good ideas are yeah. and cross-leveling those. No, uh, sir, sir, I agree. You know, in fact, and, and uh, so, you know, I, I agree, we, we, have, we have to do a better job at looking with other services, not just because I quite frankly think we've looked at it from a joint basing perspective, but, but not a holistic perspective right. with the other services, which is what you're getting at. That's so right. you're exactly right, sir, that's what we now need what, Let's make sure the audience is writing some questions down here because my ammo is getting lower. I'm, just, I'm trying to get some good ideas. But just have people go up to the mic. Are, Anybody are, go up to the mic if you have The other question. thing is, you know, Jordan, the, 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 to follow on with uh, Alan, what you said, and Ed, just because I think there is, there's been a lot of successes somewhat to work with industry and stuff. You know, a lot of things you hear from a lot of people now is about all the 5G and then how do we have it? We're going to get new capabilities with IBIS. It's going to go from a training thing in there. Um, are there any new initiatives that you're doing, uh, you know, uh, uh, within the policy or everything with the 5G and all that kind of stuff and, you know, Internet of the future and to help things 
there are going on because I think that's really going to be kind of important to set the conditions on staff. And that's, you know, the, the younger kids, they, they do that, I mean, uh, to be able to do that. So uh, can you answer that or address any of that? Uh, yeah, sure. So, if, you know, all the things that, that we talk about, whether it's a suite of sensors or uh, training platforms, uh, you know, things that enable a vehicle to move around, those require some kind yeah. of 5G backbone, some kind of robust network to, to make them work, to enable that technology. And so, you know, we're, we're doing a few things. One, we're looking to be sure that we have the right policy then that designates that as a mission requirement right. as opposed to the 25-year-old-ish policy that sort of envisioned all Wi-Fi and cell stuff was just a personal cell phone thing. Right. Um, and it's not anymore. So it's a mission requirement. It's a business requirement. We need to recognize it as such so that our pursuit of this on an installation isn't constrained, um, you know, by AFES or, or anybody else that, that thinks that they need to have a hand in, in enabling that. Uh, and then we've also, when Mr. Beeler mentioned it, we've had some installations of the future, futuring sessions uh, to include an industry day where we've reached out and are looking for partnership opportunities where we can offer up something like the use of our installation in exchange for uh, maybe some 5G employment uh, or a roadmap to an installation of the future. I mean, we've got you know, real estate that we can exchange if you want to erect a tower and put some 5G sensors on it, that's great. You can also use it for, you know, your, to expand your cell network or, or something else. But there are some give and gets that we can employ, I think, to make our network more robust and Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, just a, another thought on it. We also, you know, since you brought up the 5G thing, which brings up a whole slew of other issues, and former CFIUS member for the Department of Defense, you know, it's immediately jumped to Huawei when I think of this discussion. We need to make sure that we, the department, are working with our communities so that while the department wouldn't invest in a Huawei backbone for its 5G infrastructure, a small town outside the base might. And we need to make sure that we're working with our communities because that's part of our resiliency. Yeah, sure. I agree totally. Hey, hey, sir, so just to your point on, uh, and, and not to prolong it, but, but I, I, sir, so you're, you're, you're spot on. And, and one of the things that General Pernas talked about is making sure, and, and Honorable Beeler, is making sure that senior commanders are involved. Uh, so it's just not garrison commanders dealing with the local community, but the senior commander is also dealing with the local community to get at the effect that you're yeah. talking about. And then the last thing, too, you know, is that I, I think you've got to match what Jordan talked about in terms of some of these efforts with the comprehensive facilities investment strategy that, and I see Joy sitting here. Joy's really working on that. She's running point on not just looking over the next couple of years, but really looking out beyond 26, yeah. right? Um, and really the brick and mortar approach to it, but but that nests well with this other piece that we just yeah. talked about. Because if we get that right, um, first of all, we're taking care of families, we're taking care of units and being able to project the force, but, but more importantly, we're, we're saving money in the future because our buying power gets better based on our strategy. And then we have options to free up to really focus on continued modernization and readiness, et cetera. Yeah. Um, because, you know, as you know, I mean, you can, if your strategy is, is not 100% synced, um, and appropriate that you lose buying power over the time. Over time, yeah. you invest more money in Milcon um, because you're not giving sustainment money up front to repair those facilities. Because you know, and so it's, there's effects. No, I think there can be some win-wins. So we'll wins be working on five G when everybody else is doing seven G. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, that, but I think there's ways. I mean, I, I mean, Alan, we get we we do a lot of the, the joint stuff now, and we hear. Some of the professions, you know, the professing of the Air Force about their 5G thing after they're going to rebuild after the hurricane. It's just, it's really important, yeah. I think, because uh, yeah. it is a way, and it's linked to training from my perspective. I'm here with IBIS and how they want to do with it, to, to, and like you're saying, Absolutely. all the, the, the things, let alone like the load plans you need with now with the new 58 caliber howitzer, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to have to readjust all that stuff from a strategic <laughs> deployment. Todd, do you have a good question? Todd, be easy on me. You, yeah. you, you know, I, I, I he's the you man. know, he's the man. He's going to give us a tough question here. No, Will. no, sir. Uh, good morning, and General Halverson, uh, General Daly, General Gamble. Thanks uh, for hosting the panel. Uh, it's exciting from my perspective to see that uh, the AMC and the sustainment world is gathering all of those sustainment functions together with the inclusion of MCOM and now Class Eight, uh, and, and maybe in the future the financial piece. So. 
you're being able to connect uh, all of the dots that enable us to get from the strategic base to the tactical uh, to the tactical end. Um, and so recognizing those seven focus areas that you talked about and all of the functions that you are now have control of ride on ERPs. How do we get, who owns those ERPs? Is there a single manager of it? And then how do we connect all of those ERPs to provide you the data that allows you to enable readiness and then to maximize the funds that you're given to enable modernization, right? So if we have a single owner of that, then maybe we can integrate all of that that allows us to deliver uh, readiness and improve on modernization. Thanks for entertaining the question. Yeah, so hey, Todd, if I could jump in and, and then Dwayne, maybe. Um, so, so first I would just tell you, I, I appreciate your comments about AMC and MCOM, but, but I would tell you it's bigger than that. Um, our partnership with the Army G4, the headquarters DA staff, the secretariat, um, I, I think we're all linked. Uh, we're all linked with the modernization efforts, the readiness effort, and outside the Army, uh, DLA, Transcom, and so I, I just want to make sure everybody understands that this is just an arm, not an Army uh, focus. Um, it, it's, really, it's really looking at all the enterprise stakeholders. Um, and I know you know that, but I just wanted to make a point of it. The second piece is when we look at ERPs, and I, and I failed to mention that up front, but I think that's one of the key enablers to really getting after equipment readiness, supply availability. Um, and then, quite frankly, you look at all the ERPs between IPSE, uh, GFIBs, et cetera. Um, there has to be an integrated, synchronized, comprehensive strategy with regard to the ERPs. Not only the strategy, but then it has to be resource informed. And, and quite frankly, that's what General Perna has looked to undertake in his role in, in the SSPEG chair, uh, co-chair. Um, and, and he feels he owes the Army senior leaders, um, one, a comprehensive strategy, uh, but two, he thinks he has to be held accountable for that comprehensive strategy with regard to the ERPs. Um, but he has to do that, quite frankly, in concert with the great work that Robin Swan is doing at OBT, um, and the building is doing. Um, but, but as you mentioned, if we don't get that right, and that includes just not focusing on the ERP, but that's how do we maximize what we get out of the ERP to do our data analytics, because we're not doing that right now. We're still doing sample data collection in some cases where we're going around and touching platforms to get data. That's not the way we should be doing this right now. We gotta get to, we gotta leverage the information age uh, and the capabilities of the current systems. Um, the, the second thing we've got to do is making sure that, that we have the data repository that these ERPs are feeding to make good decisions for future, that are, that are driving how we look at supply availability as an example, equipment readiness. So we're not there yet. We know we have a strategy. We're sunsetting a lot of the legacy systems like AWARDS that was the old system that we run in our Army pre-position stocks. Dwayne ran point on making sure we're going to transition that to GCSS Army as an example. But there are a lot of legacy systems out there that just need to go away, and we need to, we need to build it onto ERPs. We need to go to, we just did uh, aircraft notebook for the aviation community. We're, we're sunsetting AWARS going to GCSS Army. We're going to pull the medical community in to use GCSS Army. That's the plan. Um, and, uh, and then look at movements, uh, TC Ames driving that into GCSS Army. And if we really do this right, it really leverages the power of the information age. But, but uh, we got a long way to go on that. So okay, back to the rear. Uh, I think Dwayne had a comment. So very quickly, uh, uh, Todd, I think you bring up a good point, and, I, and I, it's just not clear, right? I mean, and everything General Daly said is true, but when you get down to it, if you think of the seven strategic focus areas General Perna has laid out, um, he's laid them out not only for his headquarters as the Army Material Command CG, but he's laid it out for the Army as the senior army logistician, right? So as I, as you know, when I was about six, eight months ago, I'm just trying to think through this. I made a pretty, pretty simple chart, put the seven strategic priorities at the top. The next row, I put, you know, I drew some Venn diagrams and tried to define the enterprise that kind of develops, you know, generates the readiness for those things. And it's pretty easy, you know, be think of installation, installation readiness, you know, the, the enterprise that generates installation readiness is the secretariat, the Army staff, IMCOM, 
uh, you know, now AMC. And then I then I put down at the tactical level, right? Who, what commander delivers that? You know, delivers installation readiness. And to me, is pretty clear, crystal clear, right? At the, at the micro tactical level, it's the garrison commander. He or she is the face to the army when it comes to installation readiness. One level above them, right? Because I was the ASC commander. ASC was kind of a supporting effort to that role, running the LRCs, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's pretty clear. And you can go through each one of those seven, uh, and the first six were crystal clear to me. Who the, who the stakeholders are in the enterprise that generates it, what the Venn diagram looks like at the tactical level. I could name the commander, you know, or the organization that delivers it. Then I got the logistics information systems. Now, it was a little less, it was a little more focused than ERPs, but just to, for logistics information systems. I, I had the Venn diagram right, the supporting commander, I put a question mark, and the commander delivers that ready to the field, I put a question mark. Then I went and saw General Perna quarterly update, and I said, hey, sir, you know, forgive me, but you know, I was really focused on, this was when IMCOM was assigned to AMC, I was kind of focused on the left side of my chart, and I said, you know, on the right side of the chart, you know, I organized it in a way that it went from clear to muddy. And on the right, so on the left side of the chart was, you know, soldier and family readiness, crystal clear to me, MCOM, right? On the right side of the chart was logistics information system readiness. It was muddy, muddy water. He says, yeah, you're right. Nobody owns it. He says, that's why I'm taking that on as a senior commander. So I think General Perna, as the senior commander, owns it now because he signed up for it. The Venn diagram is pretty clear. General Daly talked about it. Um, but I do think it's a little bit of a soup sandwich, right? I mean, I, it's just not quite, you know, firm, uh, firmed up, and General Pern has helped us firm it up. I, I do think, as AMC, you know, is vested with more responsibility, that that turbidity will kind of settle out of the out of that pond, if so to speak. Um, and it's already getting more clear. But General Daly hit the nail on the head. You know, it's really about breaking down the stove pipes, pipes that, that, quote, protect the data. Because if we can get the data, right, and we can link the ERPs together, you know, through a data environment to see ourselves and do, you know, really some, some, we can do some remarkable things. And in industry, I mean, just yesterday, a couple of visits I did to some industry partners here at the convention, you know, it's really remarkable what industry's been able to do with data and how they can get to, you know, machine learning. Uh, and the thing that, in my view, that holds us up right now, I think we're a lot closer than we've ever been, but still, the, you know, people are protecting data for, I don't know, I don't know why, right? There's, as long as it's protected from, from, from our adversaries, but within that, you know, protected enclave, so to speak, called the Department of Defense, there's still people that are protecting their stovepipe when it comes to data, and that's gonna limit us. But, but anyway, I, I didn't want to let it go, and I, I said, said I'd be quick, and I wasn't. I'm sorry. But, um, but you, you hit on a, 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 at least something that I tried, I've tried. i been wrestling with, right? It's not clear you know, who's responsible at the tactical level, level to deliver uh, that kind of readiness. But, but, but Dwayne, I'm, I'm sorry to have to jump in on this, too, and I will be quick. You know, you hit on something. It's, frankly, ownership, don't spend a lot of time on that. You know, and both... General Halverson and I now work for companies that look at this capability. And there's modern capabilities that make the ownership question not the relevant question. Right. It's the data question that's right. the relevant question. And it's how do you intermingle the data from those different systems, which you can do with cloud-based environments, and then using that data to greater effect than we certainly do today. And that's using all those tools that we just talked about. Right. I will. I will be quick. Super quick. So right now, the Army has a uh, combined CIO G6 at the uh, at the headquarters department, of the Army level. I, I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't imagine that uh, that is a construct that'll that'll persist for many more years. I wouldn't be surprised if you see us do something more like the private sector and maybe have a dedicated chief information officer and even perhaps a dedicated chief data officer. So that won't solve ownership at the at the tactical level or or of a at the each of the ERPs, but It'll help provide a, a more cohesive strategy from there. That's good. All right, can I rear left? Yeah, all Thanks, on. gentlemen. Uh, uh, Mark Belensky from Military Officer Association. Uh, this is a question, uh, is reference uh, just some in installation modernization. 
And the question is what predictive maintenance measures in inspection processes will be modernized to really get at uh, barracks, family housing, and child care programs? What will be modernized or what would we like to modernize? <laughs> So, so I, you know, no, no guarantees, but um, all of those sensor-based analytics that, that we talked about before, you know, would be ideal. So a lot of the systems that we buy already, you, you can hardly spec a commercial HVAC that doesn't come with sensors and some kind of uh, uh, data interface. And so what we're working toward then is figuring out a way to enable those or network those so that we can use the analytic capabilities that they offer. So rather than change a filter, for instance, on some calendar basis, you can use the sensor to tell you uh, when the right time is to change the filter. So it's very simplistic and it's a lot of low hanging fruit at, at this point, but we gotta put that enabling structure in so that all the bits and pieces that we buy, we can really get, a, get the benefit from. Yeah, hey, um, and so to tag on, uh, so Jordan is spot on in, um, uh, within AMC, we're going to do what we call, call a couple of proofs of concept uh, to get at what we call a smart barracks uh, uh, construct. We'll do that probably, we'll have it uh, started up beginning of January probably, um, using the right uh, acquisition strategy. Um, but we're refining the requirements and looking at the statement of objectives now to get at exactly what Jordan just talked about earlier and then now and then what Honorable Estevez has mentioned. Uh, I think that'll be a jump off point because we can adjust it in stride to really get, get to where we want it to be. Over. Uh, the, the other thing I'd say there, and you know, of course I mentioned predictive maintenance earlier in my comments, it works best when it's like uh, what Jordan just said, the censored platform is feeding into a database. That database also has commercial if you do it right. So it's not just what's going on in the Army, it's what's going on in the commercial, so then you can make better, more informed decisions. Those tools can actually also work when it's not censored. They're not as good, but they can work when it's not censored. But what you need is, I'll go back to my comment to General Gamble, you need the data, right? So in our logistics system, we have pretty good data on, I did a, a you know, I had to order a part. There go, I'm thinking that that part was broken and there's repair against that. And that data resides in, you know, GCSS Army or an LMP or uh, through D-List, some, some database has that data. A local repair at an installation isn't in a central database where we can get at it. So then you can start making those kind of informed decisions. So it's, it's a harder nut to crack without doing that kind of censored picture of the future. Yeah. And sure, you know, um, and, and so you're exactly right. And so what we're going, uh, and Joy knows this, um, we're, we're going to input, and I think we're, we're about 10% right now into, into the, to the migration of all of the, the um, information associated with all of our infrastructure, infrastructure down to building level and within the, each building uh, to a program called Builder. That'll be our data repository that we can then superimpose a visualization tool and start looking at, um, and again, Joy is uh, intimately involved in this, um, so that we can really look at how we work the investments of the future. But, but Builder uh, is monumental improvements, in my mind, to what the ISR system was. Even though that was good for its time, Builder is the next generation. And so this starts to get after what you just talked about, sir, seeing the data, and be able to make informed investments accordingly. Right. You, you had one more part of your question I didn't want to avoid, but I, you had one other part of your question. No? No, gentlemen, gentlemen thank you. I, uh, you've answered it. Appreciate we'll it. We'll take the okay. left front. Okay. Yes. Good morning, gentlemen. My name is Dean Weld. I'm from Joint Staff J48. So I've, I've got the rose pinned on me to write the Joint Concept for Logistics 2035. Okay. As part of that, uh, we have a broad community of interest of which the Army is, is a part. We're looking at the problem set a little differently from the competition and armed conflict perspective. Uh, competition, we're having some challenges on what does logistics look like in competition, especially when we're looking at enabling uh, globally integrated operations in a theater agnostic approach. And so to that respect, I mean, I've got a laundry list of questions, but I'll take an appetite suppressant and uh, 
give you guys a couple just for consideration. It's like that movie Old School. I got one question with 32 parts. Yeah, we just give you one. <laughs> Copy, uh, sir. One question. Copy, well, sir. Back to school. Um, back to school. So yeah. w one of the things from a competition perspective is, is understanding that we don't want to just show our hand completely on what we're doing from a logistics perspective to enable uh, uh, blunt and surge forces. So uh, in, in a counter-informatized uh, uh, perspective that's now being uh, renamed into Joint Information Advantage, how do you see the space cyber or other JIA capabilities enabling log in a, a competition to project power? Cyber question. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I think. I mean, I mean, I think the whole aspects. We've, we. I mean, we're. I mean, please talk about that because where we are before and where we are now, just understanding the environment, we're taking a lot more. You know, processes that we're. Well, for, from a, a clarif clarification perspective, yeah. we don't want to advertise everything we're doing, so we have static storage throughout various theaters. So if you if you take something even more specific to kind of like a commercial options to enable support the blunt uh, surge forces. I mean, what are your challenges that you see there and what do you think the impact is from an RSO and I perspective? So I think, I think what you've got is you've got this delicate balance, right, be, between theater army requirements um, because space and time matters, right? Um, so you inevitably have to pre-position things forward into the theater um, in order to be able to, one, support the contact and blunt layers, but two, be able to be able to react to the speed of the requirement, um, but you said um, you said AOR agnostic, and so that's where I think the balance comes in between that piece and dynamic force employment, yeah. which is where we put our things in conus, understanding that we, based on indicators and warnings, have time to move things to the appropriate theater, um, but we got to be very very careful because we can't be totally myopic and look at one or the other. It has, has to be looked at it holistically. Um, because as you know, I mean, the, the cyber threat um, to our distribution system, uh, the physical threat, the kinetic threat to our distribution system in time of war, and then quite frankly, the vulnerabilities that you mentioned uh, are troubling as well. And so we have to understand that in the depth and breadth of the battle space from the strategic support area to the tactical point of need, it's going to be contested. Um, and so this is the delicate balance that we work through now. And the principle has to be this balance between forward deployed, forward position, and dynamic force employment construct. So I hope that gets out a little bit what you saw. Yes, we mentioned. So, yeah. Yeah. Go we'll ahead. go to the far left. Really, I just want to, you know, we'll go to the far right. I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. We have to follow up. I'm sorry. That's no, good. Okay, uh, my name is Kevin Graham, work for the uh, U.S. Army. Can you, can you spoil, uh, speak more into your mic so I can yeah. hear you? Yeah, that's me. Okay. Right. So, uh, my name is Kevin Graham, I work for the Communication Electronics Command at Aberdeen Proving Ground. Uh, I know we're talking a lot about tactical readiness, which is awesome, come from a maintenance logistics background. Uh, my question is, how do we ensure that Soldier 10 level field maintenance capabilities are included in C5 ISR workload and discussions? Ten, I say again, 10 level maintenance is involved in, included uh, in, in C5, C5 ISR uh, workloading um, discussions. So, for example, I know uh, General Gamble, uh, when you're in Europe, and I was in Europe as well as a regional maintenance manager, uh, you established a uh, passback maintenance SOP for the 21st TSC. Uh, that was something that was very beneficial from, the, from balancing the contractor and government workloads that we had there at the regional support center. Is that something that could be adopted army-wide so that we understand uh, from 940 at Bravo, uh, cap you know, sense what capabilities exist at the tactical level vice, what are we pushing yeah. back to, you know, contract logistics facilities and or organic depot facilities? Right, so I, 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 under, I think I understand your question. So it, for, but the operator level, right? Um, I can't name a system that that the operator is separated from the equipment when it comes to operator level responsibilities to maintain that system. Um, but I'm also cognizant that most most 10 manuals, right, have no op, very little beside PMCS operator responsibility, right? PMCS, one of the, one of the uh, old tricks was that a maintenance train walk, you know, the ADCS would come down, ask the battalion commander, how many, how many items on your whatever it was, Humvee, <laughs> Uh, are operator installed and 
you know, the answer is zero, right? It's all organizational maintenance. And so over time, you know, we've, we've taken organizational maintenance out of units through TAA to build, uh, to build more cap capable formations. Uh, and then when we station them, through stationing, we exacerbate the problem and we don't station support maintenance companies are uh, there to support it. So I, I, I gets back to, you know, my, my thesis, right? You, okay. We have to be excellent at echelon, right? Um, and we have to figure out, and I've had this discussion recently uh, with General Ostrowski, uh, is we have, to, we have to figure out how long we're gonna have contracted logistics support and what our exit strategy is for contracted logistic, yeah. logistic support. Um, and, and so one of the things we've been talking about when that is we modernize systems. How do we use organic capability that we already own in the Army? Soldiers and logistics assistance reps, representatives from this LCMCs. How do we get them involved in modernized, sustaining modernized equipment faster? So as the CFT start delivering in just here in a year or two, the first CFT you know, capabilities we deliver to a subset of the force, left to our, our, our uh, historical preference, we will have contract logistics support as the uh, preferred solution. And we need to start thinking now about how do we transition that to soldiers faster? How do we leverage capacity where, where we already own? Over, I don't know what the number is today, but it's north of 800 logistics assistance representatives that are experts and trained and capable experts to help units build ready, build and maintain readiness. If we can get them left in the acquisition process as part of the, the uh, life cycle sustainment plan, uh, then I think we can start knocking down uh, some of your concerns, if that makes sense, over. Sir, sir, thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. All right. Looks like I'm the last question standing. Um, can, can I take you back to resourcing for a minute? I'm John Conger. I'm the former Deputy Comptroller at DOD and former uh, Installations and Environment at, at OST. Um, I, my question's on resourcing. I'm, I'm listening to all of the conversation up here, and I won't make you say it, but it sounds like you don't have enough resources. I hear ruthless prioritization. I hear affordability. I hear the secretary say yesterday he's going to find $10 billion somewhere else in the Army to move into modernization, and I guess I know where that's coming from. Um, <laughs> the, the, when, when we think about uh, the seven priority areas and, and what might or might not be fully resourced out of those seven focus areas, um, my, I guess the question I have for you is, are you going to be willing to spend money to save money? Now, in the environment we've been in, you know, BRAC is a good example of spending money to save money. Well, we're not allowed to do that. So uh, in a zero-sum environment, when you're living in sequestration, there's no incentive to spend money to save money. What you have is an excess of requirements and only so much money to spend, and so you just you know, draw your cut line, and you don't end up investing in lowering your future costs. As you look forward, and in this new mindset, are you willing to invest and to spend more money someplace to lower that burden in the future and to lower your sustainment costs in the future, across installations or logistics, but I think you probably do it better in logistics than, than we've done it historically in installations. So I'll, I'll jump on that, sir. The, uh, I think the answer to your question is yes. Uh, I've seen it. Uh, I've seen it within Army Material Command. Um, I've done it as the Army Sustainment Command commander. Uh, and and I, I can talk you offline, it'll be too long, give you a couple examples. Uh, but most cases, the ones that come to mind, involve hiring somebody to help us, right? Yeah. Spend money to save money, uh, hire a capability that we didn't have. Uh, but personally, when, you know, when I was on the execution side of the table, like two months ago, the, um, I was willing to do that as long as we had an exit strategy and that we got that back, you know, we got that back into our Department of the Army civilian, you know, framework for execution. So hired X number of contracted capability for, for capacity we didn't have that made, we, we, did, we didn't spend years doing a business model, right, or BCA or we, we did some back of the envelope math that said if we can do, if, 
to Mr. Estevez's point, if we can manage our contractors contracts better, we can save money and free it up to, to knock down some of our higher priorities. Um, and we hired, I think I gave, I gave the gentleman that worked for me permission to hire 10 contractors, but within a year, those contractors were gonna go away and we were gonna train our Department of Army civilian workforce to do that same task. And it worked. And so as long as we're not, it's not a, if it, so very simplistically, right? More readiness at the same level, the same expenditure rate is, that's a, that's a win. Um, same level, same expenditure, you know, the same readiness for less money, that's a win. But more readiness for less money, that's the golden ring we're looking for. More, what I tell people is more readiness for more money, I'm not interested in. And, and I don't mean to preach, but, but I think that's the cautionary, that's what I would say is a caution. If more readiness, more money for more readiness, we have to have the courage to do it, but we have to understand what we're getting ourselves into because we can't, it can't be, we can't sustain that. Right, it has to. We have to get over a hump, or get over the learning curve, and then get into a sustainment. If that makes sense. I mean, the, the challenge we always ran into was the the not changing the oil in your car. We don't want to say it, that that's not the the savings model yeah. that you want. You don't want to save money by not refusing to change the oil because you're going to have to pay the engine. And and right. are we willing to do that up front, preventative yeah. maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, expenditure? Yes, sir. So it, it, an installation example of that is, um, well, it, we, we don't do well uh, in buying the equipment that, that maintains our, uh, installation readiness across our Army for a multitude of reasons. Uh, General McGuire, uh, he's, he's been partnering with AMC uh, even before MCOM worked for AMC <clears throat> to bring to record in G Army all the commercial equipment in Army installations. Where we were a year ago was horrific, horrific, uh, horrific in terms of uh, you know bringing it to record in G Army so we could see the data, right? right? See we could see ourselves through the installation readiness lens, and so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's not in G Army. It gets up to the MDEP managers at headquarters, DA, who resource it, and you say you have this much money we need for to maintain equipment, just the maintenance of the equipment, not to buy new equipment, and they say, well, prove it to me. Show me the G Army data. Well, there is no data, so it gets underfunded, and it's a self-fulfilling prospect. So some of it, some of this, the, I'll just use it as a, your question as a metaphor, right? Are we willing to in, invest the time, the leader time required to save money, right? So you spend money, spend our own time and our own resources is part of it. And, that, and honestly, that's, that's my experience over the last two years through Secretary Esper's leadership as it manifested itself down through General Pern and General Daly and Miss Adams as they held us all accountable. You know, the biggest investment we made uh, is time and in leadership time to, to reform the way we did business. Um, and last thing I'll tell you, say is this, uh, now that I'm on the Army staff side of the table, somebody said, uh, I was talking to a senior leader the other day uh, last Friday in my office and this person said something like well you know it's not clear to me who I talk to now for resourcing inside the Army is it the Army staff or is it AMC right because over the last couple of years it's been AMC and traditionally resourcing has been the Army staff's responsibility and I said sir both right a you know, this whole process General Daly you know talked about it earlier you know the peg principal I'm the peg principal but the the champ, the co-chairs, the champions, the quarterback, this whole framework, that should complement the, the brass tacks of what the Army staff ought to be doing, which is programming. It doesn't replace it. And so some people think it's replaced it. Um, and it can't, it, you know, the, the Army staff still has, that's, our, that's the Army staff's day job, right, is, you know, resource in the Army. Um, and some people, mis I think some people mistook the last two years of, of senior leader, two POM cycles of senior leader involvement to be a uh, replacement for that process. It's, it's it complements the process. And there's room for that complementary work, but, there, but there's also the necessity for the Army staff to keep doing its job, if that makes sense, over. Yeah, I, yeah I, that's a great, I mean, there, the, you know, 
sir, you, as you all know, that that balance is going to be there, and, and really you do have to do so. One of the things, as you know, it's like you have to have manpower savings, and therefore you can have capital investments, and a lot of those types of the discussions. And I think that's some of the things we we uh, we always wrestle with. But for for everyone on the panel, I just want to say, yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, it's been a great uh, a great session today. Thanks for the interaction and stuff, and the in the, in the bold uh, thoughts thrown out there. It's a complex environment, and we're, and we're trying to work this insulation just like everyone here. Is how do we project this up in this new environment where we have to have overmatch, and we have an enemy that's investing, and the days of us uh, you know, navigating wherever we want may not happen. So I really do appreciate everyone coming out today, and have a great AUSA, Army Strong. Well, I'm a, I have bourbon uh, bottles of bourbon. Here. Okay. And that's good. 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 Good.